This is the Brain Over Belly podcast, solving the puzzle of obesity with Dr. David Brown of Idaho BMI. Most of us are quick to associate weight loss with exercise, but could it be true that sleep affects our weight more than any workout? Listen as Dr. Brown shares sleep science and sleep advice that will have you looking and feeling your best. Here's your host, Rick Dunn. We are back. Sleep is going to be the uh, the big topic today. So this is going to be fun and interesting. Well, I don't know about fun, but interesting, yes, and important. Uh, sleep is more important than exercise when it comes to losing weight and keeping it off. The fact is it's, it's a shocker for a lot of people that that is a fact. Today we're going to dig into why that's the case with Dr. Brown. We're also going to check in with Mona to see how she's doing. Mona, welcome back. Thanks, Rick. feel like you're here every week now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been six months. You want to give us a quick recap on uh, where you're at and how you feel? Well, I feel fantastic. I'm down almost 50 pounds. Um, I have recently taken out of my before picture and uh, looked at it and went, wow, <laughs> you so guys you do. were right. <laughs> you see a difference. <laughs> I do see a difference now, yeah. Okay. So I was glad I took before pictures because I'm like, ah, I don't see anything. But there definitely is a change. You don't want to take them when you're uh, when you're in that place, do you? Oh, Even though no. you know it's going to be better later no, on. No, I definitely, um, there's hardly any pictures of me. Yeah. Because I'm usually the one taking the pictures because of my weight. I didn't want to be in photographs right. and stuff, So, which is crazy because you look back now and think with memories with your children and your grandchildren and that time in life. And it's like, where are you, mom? Where Where are you, grandma? Right. How come you're not in the picture? And. Uh, well, Grandma was fat and didn't want to be in it. <laughs> so yeah, your grandkids yeah. are like, "What?" Yeah, because yeah, we that, love you, the, Grandma. Right, this, that's all they know me as. They just know me as um, yeah. this fluffy Grandma that they can snuggle into. So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, six months. How often do you take the photos out? Was that the first time? Or yeah, that was just really? be- just before my surgery, like wow. the night before my surgery. Oh god! So it's good to see that there's an actual physical difference yes. as well. Huh? Yes, I was um, completely surprised. I mean, 50 pounds sounds uh, enormous, you know, and you oh, yeah. you would think I'd be skinny now, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I still have a ways to go, but it's it's a process, yeah. you know, and I'm a work in process and I'm excited about it. And yeah. I've been uh, following my advice and getting out and doing more and right. uh, going to dinners and and just being out and about. And I love it. I know that you're in a good place when it comes to energy. Uh, You're sleeping. We're going to talk a lot about that today. And then, of course, losing weight. So the physical difference, it's it's all kind of coming together for you, Mm -hmm. the mental part of things. So we're going to get into all of that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Brown, I know you want to talk about sleep today. More than once, we've heard you make the shocking claim that sleep is more important than exercise for permanent weight loss. And recently, we were just discussing, well, you were saying that... It's actually almost impossible or maybe impossible to lose the weight that you want to be losing and to be as healthy as you want to be if you're not getting the proper amount of sleep. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. In my own experience uh, with patients, that is always the case, and I think the research literature would back that up. Why is sleep more important than exercise? I I to me, that kind of blows my mind. To me, I think of when I want to lose weight, I'm going to go to the gym. I think a lot of people think that. And yeah, they think, okay, I need to get enough sleep. I need to drink enough water. I got to watch what I eat, but I'm going to go exercise and I'm going to lose this weight. You're saying sleep is more important than exercise. Yes. And yeah, why is I'm, that? It's Well, it's fascinating stuff, but it's basic human biology. It's the way we evolved or were created, however you want to think about it. Uh, we are connected to light and to the sun. Uh, Most folks are familiar with the idea of circadian rhythms, the light phase of our lives, the daytime and the nighttime. Well, our brains and our whole bodies are very much connected to light. And so uh, sleep, of course, is something that we do at night traditionally, and um, we are designed to function optimally when we are following the sun with our sleep. 
Right. If we don't, things get off kilter and things do not work right. And one of the things that doesn't work right is our regulation of appetite, weight, stress, anxiety, a lot of things. So that's why I'm so messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Grab onto that, Rick. <laughs> I'm trying to. <laughs> I go to sleep fairly early, but uh, I get up really early. What is your schedule like, Mona? Well, I have always been an eight-hour person. I function better if I have eight hours of sleep. It's not always uh, happening, or it hasn't always happened. But uh, since the surgery, it's something uh, I've tried to be more aware of. And so I do my breathing exercises here lately to help me fall asleep. So they had relax me. And you, I had a big problem falling asleep. You did. You had pretty much sleep apnea, correct? Well, I still do. I still do have sleep apnea. And I guess that's something else we're going to talk about today. But with my sleep apnea, um, it's that's what caused my heart problems. It's something I've had my whole life. And it's because my not just because of my weight, it's because my mouth is the way it's shaped and uh, too small. So I've had it my whole life. And I've had nightmares, I mean, violent, awful nightmares. I can remember since a small child, like a toddler, and I was always waking up and going to sleep with my parents because of nightmares. And it was my body's reaction to wake me up because I wasn't breathing. Is that common, Dr. Brown, with uh, most of your patients? How common is that? Sleep apnea? Yeah. Uh, it's very common. I, I mean, mean, that's connected to uh, people that have weight issues a lot of times? Yes, and there are different types of sleep apnea. There is one kind we call central sleep apnea, and that's really a neurological, sort of a brain-driven issue with sleep. The more common type is called obstructive sleep apnea, and that is more closely correlated with weight and obesity. As you know, people struggle with weight, there's excess tissue in places. And one of the things, one of the challenges that uh, introduces is partial collapse of the airway when people sleep because they're so relaxed. And so people wake up and they don't sleep very well. So that sounds, I I have had this issue in the past where I, I find myself waking up, not being able to breathe, and then I'm trying to gasp for that breath. You look like you're surprised. Well, that's not very good. I know. <laughs> what? What is, is that not the same thing? <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of people will say my, my spouse reports that I snore a lot. And that's, yeah. that's the most common sign. But yeah, if, if you're waking up sort of coughing and breathing fitfully or not breathing, yeah, that's, a, right. that's somewhat suggestive. Right. So yeah, it's a big deal. You need to be breathing. Uh, <laughs> I just generally. want to clarify that. It's a big deal, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> I do know that. <laughs> okay. I, half the time I don't even know what's going on cuz I go right back to sleep and it's uh my girlfriend says, oh, "Hey." Good. And uh, yeah, well, I guess that's good, but she'll talk about the snoring, the excessive snoring and I feel like I've gotten better. I try to take and I don't feel like I have a lot of weight to lose, but the lessons that we learn here with brain over belly, I think, are great for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're just trying to lose. You just want to be a healthier person, a better person, and mentally in a, a better place. I hope so. I mean, ultimately, what we're shooting for is longevity and health span. In other words, right. helping folks live longer and be healthier for a bigger portion of their life. So if you mess up the sleep setting in the brain, you also mess up the weight and appetite settings. That's correct? Yes. So back in residency. So I trained back east for my surgical residency, and we covered trauma. And so I spent a lot of nights awake working, and it was so common for me to say 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, having just finished with a, a trauma case, to be walking through the lounge and to see a, a pizza sitting there. And I really wasn't hungry whatsoever, but I was awake and there was a pizza. It just was a knee-jerk thing. I had to have two pieces of pizza. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, that was an indication in my own life that, yeah, there absolutely is a connection. One of the the best lessons I've learned as we've gone through this uh, journey is to listen to your body and to not eat when you're not hungry. And you realize when you when you try to do that, you realize how much you actually do eat when you're not hungry, just like you're talking about with yep. the pizza. 
Because you don't even think about it. You're just going after something. You're like, wait, wait a minute. Why am I grabbing for this piece of pizza? I'm not hungry. It's Maybe I'm just bored. Right. Or it's I, habits. I don't know. I think part of it is that we've been told for so long that you got to have three meals a day. Breakfast is the most important right. meal of the day. Those types of things. And so it's sort of built into our training that, well, we need to eat frequently. So it's, it's hard for a person to yeah. walk through that. And I also think that our society, everything is geared around food, whether it's family gatherings or birthday parties or meeting up with yeah. friends. It, it's all Culture. around food. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a big social thing. Absolutely. I'm, I, I'm going out. Uh, my girlfriend and I are going out with a couple tomorrow night. And then I have to consciously think, well, I don't need uh, an alcoholic beverage. Right? I don't need... You know, if if I really want one, I mean, I could probably do one, and as long as I don't overdo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it, when you're talking about some of the habits that you form, or uh, I know as a kid, I think most of us have gone through this. You have your parents that tell you, "Hey, you're not leaving the table until you clean off that plate." Yes, which kind of got me to a place where I always felt like, well, I have to clean off that plate, whether it was at a restaurant or I'm at somebody's house. I felt like I was rude if I didn't eat the entire dinner. But you're kind of being rude to yourself when you do that kind of thing. Right. It's, a lot of us experience some degree of Pavlov training when we're kids. Yeah. Food is either used as a reward or you are rewarded for eating your food. And so it's hard as you grow up and you are an adult to work out of that. It's it's built in at that point. To go boxes. That's that's my thing now. I get that to go. That's going to last me three, four meals. <laughs> well, so that's kind of the uh, dirty secret that nobody talks about with the surgery is all the leftovers you have <laughs> because yeah, right. you've got to learn how to cut your recipes down so you're not making as much food. And for me, it was learning not to dish up as much of a serving. So I didn't uh, have that Right. Knee jerk reaction that I've got to finish everything on my plate. You have to consciously think about these things, or that's what I've been doing. So, uh, you know, my fridge is full of leftovers nobody will eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a different issue. <laughs> but yeah, but that's, you have to realize your portion control. Right. So, sleep hygiene. What is that? Sleep hygiene. Yes. It's habits surrounding sleep. We all have them, and we want to improve them and make them good. And healthy, so yeah, it's there are a lot of different things um, relating to sleep that we can work on, and things that we can do in our lives every day to improve our sleep. And the impact of doing that is just incredible in a person's life. So it involves, of course, what time we go to sleep, right? What we do before we sleep, um, light, sound. There's a lot that goes into sleep habits and what contributes to good sleep. So let's break some of that down specifically. Um, What was the first thing you mentioned? What time you go to sleep? Yeah. What time should we be going to sleep? I know it's probably different for each person. Sure. Everybody's a little different. And it used to be that we'd say everybody's different. Some people thrive on five hours of sleep. Some people do better on eight I think more and more research is suggesting uh, actually everybody, just about everybody, is closer to eight hours of sleep a night as far as optimal performance. And with sleep, something that the evidence does point to pretty clearly is that consistency is key. Mm -hmm. Um, Having a consistent habit of going to bed at the same time, nearly the same time, super helpful. Right. And your eating habits kind of are the same way as as sleep. I mean, you usually kind of eat at the same time. I guess you're listening to your body, so it could be any time, right? It is for me. I'm I'm still trying to figure that out. So are your meals then, Mona, are they at random times Mm -hmm. now? They are. Yeah, it's it's whenever I'm hungry. So your husband has to kind of... uh, Fend for himself. (laughs) That's right. Make your little extra. I might want some, but not right now. He doesn't ask the question, when's dinner anymore? He never has. He's oh, always he cooked. Yeah, oh, he's I've a got cooker. A, oh, yeah, I've got a great man. You <laughs> bet. <laughs> Especially since you got a smoker. And that will be my tip to any uh, woman out there, is that if your man gets a smoker, do not learn how to use it, because then you'll be the one cooking. So as long as you don't know how to work that smoker, Genius. your husband's going to cook for you every night. 
look at this. You're even getting smarter going through this whole process. We talked about that, right? Yeah. Dr. Brown said I would. (laughs) He did, didn't he? Yes, he did. We make fun about that, but it really does help you mentally, doesn't it? Oh, yes. I feel uh, quite clear like a clarity with my thinking and stuff where i felt kind of foggy and sluggish before right yeah so so with the sleep times consistency is key uh in relation to when it gets dark or the lighting or what can you tell us about that sure so consistency um so light, there's a place in our brain called the hypothalamus, and I think we've talked briefly about that before. Well, part of the hypothalamus is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN for short. And it's, it's a small structure. It's very close to where the optic nerves, which are the nerves that carry signals from the eye into the brain, it's where those two nerves cross. But this nucleus in the hypothalamus really is our master uh, timekeeper. It is a master clock. It is incredibly accurate, and it is based on light. Uh, And it's a fascinating mechanism that it has, uh, but this timekeeper in the hypothalamus, it regulates a lot of things in the body, and it's all based on light. So if we are inconsistent with our sleep habits or we stay up really late or we uh, you know, are losing sleep. It it really messes with a, a lot of things. And it happens to be that also in the hypothalamus, you know, we've talked about several structures in the brain and their relation and importance and weight and, and all of this. Uh, but the SCN is very close. It's right next door to another part of the hypothalamus that is the master sort of thermostat for weight. And so... This the function of this nucleus in the hypothalamus that is our timekeeper is just right next door to where our center of appetite and weight regulation is. And so, because it's close in proximity, it's uh, it, they affect each other. Um, Maybe it's not just proximity; it's it's just the way they are wired together. Okay. It's one affects the other. So, if and I've noticed this even in the last year. If I have a late night, I'm up, and there are things I'm doing, the next day I will have cravings, stronger cravings for sweets or for foods that aren't great for me or foods in general. Okay. And so that's, that's a known thing. That's demonstrated over and over in the scientific literature that sleep loss absolutely increases appetite. It also alters hormones in a way that promotes appetite and weight gain. And when we talk about light... Uh, for the most part, uh, you're talking about uh, how long it stays light outside, but we're in a new age here where there's lots of artificial light uh-huh. now, too. Now, how is that affecting us? Right? Enormously. So all this artificial light, um, we can stay up. We can have light, of course, 24-7, and we do. And so a lot of times before going to bed, we're on our phones or on computers or watching TV, and that light... and Specific, you know, there's a specific part of the light spectrum called blue light, and a lot of people have heard of that. Blue light is that kind of light or that spectrum of light that interferes with the function of the hypothalamus most uh, easily. Um, but yes, that's a very good point, Rick. What's natural light then? That's not blue light, right? Well, blue is a part of so the electromagnetic spectrum, the broad okay, I gotcha. range of of uh, frequencies and okay. intensities. Anyway, it's in the natural, in the light, we consider normal light. Blue is a small wedge of that spectrum. So, you know, and people have screens for computers and, and devices that will screen out the blue light. And I think there's some evidence that that, that helps. But uh, the bottom line is that screens uh, and the artificial light that we have today very much uh, can disrupt our sleep cycles. So I, uh, every night, I watch TV for about an hour and then shut the TV off and go to sleep. That's a bad thing. Well, <laughs> there are a few black Absolutely. and Absolutely, TV's whites. bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> what did you say? All TV's, TV's bad? TV's bad, yes. Uh, there's they? some positives okay. on TV. Uh, it's kind of like social media. A I lot of bad. You, but I think <laughs> you should um, be listening to the radio. <laughs> there you go. I do that plenty. You know I do that. At least there's no blue light with the radio, <laughs> That's right? That's right. Um, 
Well, I'm looking through some of the notes here, and my note says avoid screens one hour before bed. So that is optimal then. Yes, and that's one of the things I tell my patients is that first I usually will tell them to go to, try to go to bed earlier. Mm-hmm. And you'd be surprised how many people, when I ask them, people you wouldn't think, you know, a lot of older women actually, 60s and 70s, and I'll notice usually several months after surgery, they seem to be struggling um, in their progress. And I go through and I ask them questions and they're eating the right stuff, all of it. And then I ask about sleep and come to find out they're staying up till two o'clock in the morning oh, every gosh. night. <laughs> really? <laughs> and of course, I, I ask what keeps you up until two? And it's surprising how many will say I'm on a, a device playing games yes. or watching TV. And so I tell them, go to bed earlier, 10 o'clock or so if you can, and to avoid any screens for the hour before going to bed. And if you can, dim the lights in your house, actually. Right. Because that induces this state in the brain and in the body that is more um, conducive to falling asleep, makes you sleepy. That's again, we're patterned after the whole sun going down. Sure. And historically, when that happens, the temperature drops, the light drops, and there are changes in the hypothalamus and elsewhere in the body that make us sleepy. And we just naturally prepared to go to sleep. Mona has, uh, I know sleep has changed for you dramatically since you went through bariatric surgery and, um, and you're trying your best to do everything that Dr. Brown tells you to do. What was it like before? I mean, what were your habits like as far as were you watching TV? Were you playing video games? You don't look like a gamer to nope, me. Nope, I'm not a gamer. <laughs> I don't play things on my phone. That <laughs> drives me crazy. But um, I would I would definitely be up watching TV probably till 10. And depends if it was uh, I started a movie too late. So I'm waiting for it to end. And it's 11, 11.30. And then I'm heading off to bed and I can't go to sleep. So I'll get up and I'll read. I have a Kindle. So I don't. I think that's better. It doesn't have so much blue light as say a um, iPad or something like that but yeah so I'm reading and just um, anxiety you- before where I would just wake up in the middle of light and then my uh, brain just starts kicking in of thoughts of what's going on or or whatever I'm anxious about and so I couldn't sleep because of that and so um, or my head's clogged up so I'm taking Benadryl and waiting for that to kick in so I can go to sleep and right. it's always something it seems like but um, now I I cannot believe how much better I'm sleeping especially with the breathing and which causes me to relax and go to sleep i I have Alexa I should say my husband set Alexa uh, for a 10 o'clock <laughs> A reminder for me to go take my medicine and then that's when I just start get up from that shut everything down Go take my bed, mess and, you know, the bedroom drill, get ready for bed, mm-hmm. head off to bed, start to go to sleep. How's the congestion, by the way? How is it? It seems to be better. But um, since a lot of smoke, it's mm-hmm. I'm not as bad as my husband. Right. But it's, yeah. It is that connected too? Yes. It's the same thing as joint pain. Oh, as the inflammation. inflammation goes down. Yes. Right. Oh, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, so it has been better. So I was just inflamed, I guess, and that was my problem. (laughs) (laughs) Lower your temperature before bed. What does that mean? Again, got to refer to the sun. You think traditionally, sun goes down and what happens to temperature? It drops. And so our bodies are adapted to that. As the temperature drops, that is one of the factors that gets us ready to sleep. And it's true. Uh, A lot of people have done this where for whatever reason they're worn out they're stressed whatever they'll take a hot bath in the evening and they notice that after taking a hot bath they seem to fall asleep easier and sleep more soundly well what it's not the hot bath but it's the drop in temperature after getting out of the bathtub um yeah, so if you can... It does feel good to take a yeah. shower and then you go lay down feel and... sleepy. Yeah, that's it, huh? Yeah, it's it's specifically the drop in temperature in the brain and the Well, head. that's what I always do with my babies is, you know, they got a bath before they went to uh-huh. bed, you know, and I always thought it was just uh, them relaxing, you know, getting the lotion rubbed down and then, you know, clean jammies and they're all clean and going to bed. Hmm. But wow, it worked. So you were whatever. doing some it of this worked. stuff yeah. before. Yeah. Uh, I had no idea. <laughs> 
<laughs> what? You don't need a doctor. I, I do need Dr. Brown. I cannot I believe uh, as as all the stuff I have learned from Dr. Brown. So, yeah. And I'm very interested in this sleep, especially the exercise thing, because like you were saying earlier, where uh, people want to lose weight and they go think, I've got to go to the gym, and sleep is never a part of it. Uh, for me, it was never a part to go to the gym because I would lay down until that feeling went away. I was obviously <laughs> ill. I'm not going to go work out. So it's it's funny how people have different perceptions and how it works. But uh, the problem with me was I couldn't ever sleep. So talk to us about meditation. Meditation. Is, is this something all of us should be doing or yes. maybe just some of us? Yeah, we all should. Um, I've been doing it now maybe four years. Uh, yeah, the science, the, the research is pretty clear on it. At least if you're interested in reducing stress, anxiety, improving your memory, including improving creativity, sleeping better, yeah, then you my, want to meditate. My girlfriend just started getting it. I mean, when she gets into something, she gets into it. So she got into this, uh, It's a, specifically, it's like a yoga meditation, and she's been begging me to do it. So finally, I did it the other day with her. I don't like doing yoga because I feel like I, I can't bend. It's hard. It is hard. <laughs> it's yeah, hard. it's work. I'm like, I don't want to do work. She's like, trust me, this is like, it's meditating. It's okay. <laughs> And so we did it. It was amazing. Oh, it felt so good. Yep. It really did. And we went to sleep right after. Perfect. <laughs> what what kind of meditation should people be doing? Or are there different kinds of meditation? Yeah, there's, there's several different kinds. I think the most common one is called focused attention meditation. And this is sort of, you know, people. some people are feel familiar with the body scan where you just focus attention on those sensory signals. And I usually don't identify it by that name, but that's a form of focused attention meditation. But uh, there's that, one of the most common, uh, where you focus your attention on usually physical things, being in the present, focusing on your body, breathing, that type of thing. And then there's other kinds like transcendental, uh, also very common, where you just simply step back mentally and observe your thoughts. You don't try to control them or judge them. You just observe them and recognize that they are thoughts. They're not necessarily you. Right. So, but again, the research has shown pretty clearly a benefit uh, to a lot of things in our lives when we meditate. And, you know, we've talked about brain scans and this type of thing. The evidence really does point to the fact that meditation contributes to those changes in the brain that we are seeking after bariatric surgery. So it's a complementary um, influence in this journey is meditation and those breathing exercises. The breathing exercises that you have taught Mona, which I know you use those religiously, mm -hmm. so that's a, that's a form of meditation or that's part of it then, right? Yeah. It sounds like. Yep. And that has worked for you, Mona. Is there anything else that you use as far as like meditation well, as I the last time we spoke, I talked about how I will, uh, if I get negative thoughts or start stressing out, I will say stop, you know, make that hopefully break the pattern. And then I'll tell myself that I am relaxed, strong, happy, and healthy. And I just keep repeating that for like five times, five to 10 times. And I've started doing that with my breathing to help me calm down. And I've noticed that um, I am a lot calmer and I look at situations more calmly and I'm less reactive. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's been a big help for me. You can change which genes are activated in that moment doing those types of things. I think we've talked about that. We have a little bit. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, it is. White noise, pink mm -hmm. noise. I know Mona and I were both talking before we jumped on here and said, what the heck is pink noise? Yeah. What, tell us about white noise and pink noise sure. and why it's important. They're very similar. It's background noise. And most people are familiar with white noise. It's just stuff in the background that doesn't grab your attention. Um, this thing called pink noise, it's, it's sound that's generated by a machine, a device. Um, it's random. It sounds scratchy. And there's some studies that show that listening to either white or pink noise when you're trying to go to sleep and through the night actually helps you uh, get to sleep faster, 
sleep more soundly and stay in the deeper stages of sleep that are really thought to be most important. So are we supposed to keep that on throughout our sleep or is that just supposed to help us get to sleep? You do. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with that. I don't know how to turn it off. So that's true. You're asleep. (laughs) (laughs) I think I'm asleep now. (laughs) (laughs) Just shut that off. Uh, (laughs) Well, what about um, like I had a sound machine trying to sleep better gosh, probably 15, 20 years ago, where it was like uh, the sounds of the ocean. Or... I don't know. Did it work? Uh, well, I, don't know I was way. hoping. I was hoping it is. But is that considered white noise or is it I, pink I, noise? I don't know. I don't oh. know the answer. Oh, okay. I feel like that might be it's pink blue. noise. I don't know. <laughs> I, it's blue noise because it's the ocean. That's what I think. It, it's funny <laughs> because I'll turn on sounds of the ocean, sounds of rain. I think people mm-hmm. use a lot. Yeah. But sometimes my mind will listen to it and go, that doesn't sound like anything except for... <laughs> and But it's, it still kind of calmly soothes me to sleep. Right. So I don't... I guess I still don't know... Probably the, white noise is my guess. Yeah, probably I would think so noise. too. Okay. Yeah. No sleeping aids or medications. I hate seeing this because mm. I use them. And that's a bad I've thing. used them. Yeah. Um, the idea is that these medications or things that we can take to get us to sleep they're not good for us really uh they can get us to sleep or at least knock us out but it actually a lot of them can interfere with sleep in other words we either don't stay sleeping very long or they keep us from getting to the deeper stages of sleep and staying there like we should so they're a crutch and they're not super good for us and it can you know you can if you do if you use these monitors that will uh sort of look at your stages of sleep based on brain waves and movements and things. Um, and there's actually been a lot of research done on that, that yeah, they'll get you to sleep, but only in the first couple of stages. And so you don't get into the deep sleep or the REM sleep. And that's thought to be the most, uh, helpful, mm-hmm. uh, for some of the more critical brain functions. Is this something you've tried in the past? In the past, Nona? I've tried, like, when Tylenol PM came out, um, tried that. But mm-hmm. I, I would wake up the next morning. Yes, I did sleep. But I felt uh, just drugged and dragged out yeah. and awful Drug-y. the next yep. day. Yeah, just total brain fog and couldn't function from just taking a Tylenol PM. So, And I think that's different for everybody. Sometimes it'll last you six hours. Sometimes it'll last you for 12 hours. I feel the same thing. I feel groggy the next day. And so mm-hmm. the first couple hours of work... It's like, ah, and then I start feeling like myself again. And I have to use uh, melatonin when that started coming out, and that helps. That has helped a lot. Is, I, is that a bad one? I don't think so. I think of all the things that are available, melatonin is the least problematic. I mean, because that is made in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's one of the things that is released when the sun goes down and the temperature drops naturally in us that gets us ready for sleep. So... I think, uh, again, it's least problematic. I I have taken it consistently in the past. Some of those things have worked against me. I'll take some of those sleep aids and my legs get all jittery and I I feel like just crawling out of my skin and I'll never take that again. It's just so miserable. And I know they affect different people differently. But bottom line, it's better to get healthy, natural sleep. So I have a crazy story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is indirect story, but I think it's true. Uh, many years ago, a guy was on Ambien, which is one of the most commonly prescribed medications to help people sleep. Pretty heavy-duty sleeping, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So he just started it, and I think it was in his second or third day taking it. And he woke up in the middle of the night in a parking lot of Walmart with no shirt in his car eating <laughs> you, cheese. And you do hear those stories. <laughs> yes. I, I believe the story. Anyway, <sighs> there are some wow. problems with those, a lot of those medications. <laughs> That's a minor that, that, issue, isn't it? Right. <laughs> That's just a side effect. Doesn't <laughs> right. affect all No problem. <laughs> but did he get sleep? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and he ate, too. Uh, yeah. Right. In the middle of the night. See, there you go. I was struggling so bad with sleep at one point, and the doctor prescribed me Ambien. I tried it, and it did nothing for me, mm. which I, I know it was a mental thing for me because I get in my own head. I, I get a lot of anxiety that I'm not going to be able to fall asleep, and, and by doing that, I, I'm too stressed out. I'm not, I'm not relaxed enough to fall asleep. Yeah. So Especially it, when you have something big going on the next day. Yeah. Yeah. 
or in your life, you know, you're just you're starting to not be able to function the way you want, or if you're gaining weight or whatever it is, and you know that it's because of that sleep, you know how crucial that sleep is. You want to go to sleep, yeah. and you stress That's yourself tough. out over it. Right. Yeah, it is. Uh, what is happening, Dr. Brown, in the brain while we sleep that is so important? Why is it important for us to get a good eight hours of sleep every night? Great question. Uh, tons of research on that, and we don't have all the answers by a long margin. Um, so to date, I think the, the most convincing research would suggest a couple of things. You know, you go through a day, and you form memories of just everything, random things, grabbing the doorknob and opening the door, and just r- so many things, thousands, even millions of things every day. Well, if you retained all those memories, you can imagine that causing a problem. So uh, one of the main thoughts about sleep is that that is the period of time when our brain can clear all that stuff out and erase it. Uh, On the other hand, stuff that we want to keep, say we're in college and we're studying chemistry or whatever, history, and we're in the library and we're studying and we're reading and we have a test and we want to remember this. Uh, something that's very important that happens in the brain at night is what's called consolidation of those memories. Um, Or you can think of it as brain cells or circuits forming, and sleep is required for those to become uh, reinforced or become permanent. So staying up all night to study your chemistry in college works against you. And that's been shown pretty clearly if you want to remember what you've studied, you got to get good sleep. And so if you think about what we are doing after bariatric surgery, forming new brain circuits and reformatting the brain, if we want that to happen and to become permanent, we got to sleep. And then as far as uh, from a physical standpoint, sleep's crucial as well, like whether you have an injury or you're sick or... Um, right, you, repair. Right, right. So let's break down uh, everything we just talked about really quickly. So if somebody's just popping in and listening and they're going, okay, what do I need to be doing? Why is sleep so important? Uh, Let's just go down the list real quick, Dr. Brown, and and reiterate what we just talked about. So I would say sleep is more important than exercise for weight loss and weight maintenance and for a lot of things. Uh, We want to be consistent and we want to go to bed early, wake up early. And do those little things that will help us to sleep uh, the best way we can. So avoiding screens for the hour before uh, bedtime, uh, dimming the lights in the house if you can, and, and trying to be calm and maybe do some meditation before bedtime. But consistency is so important. And I've said it many times, this whole journey really is all about doing very small things very consistently. And sleep, I would very much include on that list. And I feel like you're doing a pretty good job with all of those things, Mona. Do you feel good about following the instructions that Dr. Brown gives you? I do, and I appreciate having a guideline as to what I need to do to get where I'm going. So I need a roadmap, I yeah. guess, of where I'm going. To get, and that's what I like about it. And from where I was a year ago to where I am now, um, the huge changes that have happened to me for the better – and, um, you know, I'm calmer, I'm positive, I'm, I'm not fearful, I'm not waiting for the other shoe to drop. There's just, I'm just, I guess it just flipped a switch in my brain, as Dr. Brown always talks about, and I have this more positive outlook on life now. And I'm always, I'm more positive where I wasn't before. I was very negative person, I think. I love that we're six months past the bariatric surgery. You've dropped 50 pounds so far. I can't even remember if there was a goal or what the goal is, or I think you had something kind of in your mind, but it really is more about the overall uh, well-being of yourself. That's my favorite part about when I see you come in here every couple months is you seem happy. You seem like you have a lot of energy. You seem like life is 10,000 times better than it used to be. It is. It is. Before, <laughs> I, I really, ev- everything sounded like a lot of fun to go and do until I'd have to fight my clothes to get them on and get yeah. out the door. And then it wasn't worth going, yeah. you know, so I just didn't go. 
We always give you an opportunity to uh, share your closing thoughts. You have anything for us, Mona? <laughs> You're the one going through this right now. Well, I, you know, it's it's funny you say that, Rick, because Look, I write it down. down. I always write it down because I am trying to be brave and be more positive and smile more. And I love the fact that we don't have to wear masks as much anymore, so I can see other people's smiling faces yeah. and I can smile at them too. So I I think that's important because I hid in my house so my weight i basically hid behind my weight because i was too embarrassed to go out and be seen like that if that makes any sense but um so i'm going to i mentioned last time that i was going to go to bed early and get up early and exercise i am uh, my husband and i are setting up an exercise room and um i'm just looking into signing up for these yoga classes yeah they're <laughs> and I, good. they're actually good I yeah was, i was a little bit shocked i'm like okay i can get into this yeah i'm excited to get into that too when you mentioned it so i'm excited about that i'm also um just going to be brave and focus on what is going right in my day instead of everything that's going wrong. And I'm going to calmly think about solutions to the problems that may arise because I can handle anything that comes my way now and I'm enough. Keep it up. Thanks, Rick. You look great. You always look great. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for being here as well. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Mona. Thanks, Dr. Brown.